That pasta looks good. But you know what it needs? Cheese. Yeah, cheese. Avalanche. So welcome to episode four. Tonight is a very nice night, so I've taken it outside. And tonight I am eating two boxes of penne. They're one pound boxes, and the general rule of thumb for pasta is that it doubles in mass when you cook it. So we've got about four pounds total here of pasta. And then the sauce is just under three pounds, and then the cheese is just over a half pound total. So in total, this is about seven and a half pounds of food and it's pretty tough. Uh, pasta is not easy to eat this quantity of, so it's gonna be a tough one, but uh, I will give it my best. So let's get it started. There we go. So the main two components of the pasta I'm eating are starch and gluten. And in episode two, I talked about what starch is. It's just a repeating chain of glucose saccharide units, and it occurs naturally in plants in two forms. One is a single long chain called amylose, and the other is a more branched form called amylopectin. But like I said in episode two, once these are all inside your body, the bonds between the saccharide units are quickly broken down by hydrolysis, and you're just left with many glucose molecules. Starch in its simplest form is just a white tasteless powder. If hot water is added to it, you can make a paste, but it doesn't mix well with cold water. And the texture and taste of starch makes it something that by itself is not very appetizing, but the plants where the starch grows also contain gluten, which is a binding material. So now let's talk specifically about what gluten is and what it does. Gluten is a Latin word that means glue and that is effectively what gluten does at the molecular le level. It binds together starch chains, which adds texture and elasticity. It occurs naturally in wheat, barley, rye, and a few other grain types. And in addition to adding elasticity, it also provides protein content. So now let's demonstrate some of the properties of gluten at the molecular level and how it interacts with starch chains. On the left here, we have some dough that has been thoroughly kneaded and the excess starch has been washed out. And on the right here we have some dough that has not been as thoroughly kneaded and the excess starch has not been rinsed out. So uh, what you're doing when you're kneading bread is you're creating these long networks, these big networks of starch and gluten. And what these networks are able to do is they're able to form uh, sort of bubbles where the yeast, when it produces carbon dioxide, these bubbles get trapped in there longer and uh, you get the, the bread rises more. So on the left here, this bread should rise quite a bit. And on the right here, this bread will also rise, but not quite as much. So uh, we're gonna put this in the oven for a little while and we'll see how it comes out. So while the bread is baking, I just want to give one more analogy as to how the starch and gluten molecules interact. On this side, we've got just plain bits of paper and they are not bound to one another. They all act independently. And these all represent starch chains. And then on this side, I've added a small amount of chewing gum and silly putty. And a lot of them, a lot of these bits of starch are now acting as a team, they're coagulating. And I probably could have added more, but this sort of gets the idea across. The, the, the putty and the chewing gum act as the gluten. So to discuss all the different sensitivities people have to gluten would take a long time. So I'm just gonna take a moment here to talk about celiac disease. 
Now, celiac disease affects the small intestine, and you may just think of the small intestine as sort of a hose that connects the stomach and the large intestine, but when you get to the microscopic level, you see all these things. They're, they sort of remind me in their form of sea anemones, and they have a very high surface area to volume ratio. They're called villi, and what they do is they absorb nutrients from the small intestine and pass them into the bloodstream and throughout the rest of the body. And when you have celiac disease, celiac disease is an autoimmune disorder similar to type 1 diabetes. And what that means is it, the body senses something that is not necessarily harmful like gluten and thinks of it as a toxin. And the way the body deals with toxins normally is inflammation, which means that plasma passes into the mucosal membrane beneath these villi and it inflates this mucosal membrane and these villi can no longer uh, get to the food. The food can't get into the villi where it can get absorbed by the body because they're all uh, puffed up and they just don't have the surface area that they normally do. So um, when you have celiac disease and you eat gluten, you get inflammation in your intestines, which is very painful, and your body can't absorb the nutrients that it needs. So, uh, unfortunately, the only real way to deal with celiac disease uh, with modern technology is to just completely exclude gluten from your diet. So, obviously, this is an area where research will hopefully start moving uh, faster in order to find more treatment and cure. But anyway, that is the end of this lesson, and I hope you enjoyed it. All right, it's time for the bread. And if my gluten predictions are correct, the loaf on the left has risen a little bit more. All right, that looks perfect. As you can see, the loaf on the left has risen a bit more. That is gluten science at its best. So let's eat some bread. Ah. Ah. Now that is some good pasta. Oof. I want to thank you for tuning in to episode 4 of Eating Cereal, and now I'm going to eat this bread. Coming up, we all love ice cream, but is there such a thing as too much? Next time on Eating Cereal.